Hello and welcome to the live streamer backstage podcast. Today it is my great pleasure to be talking to none other than JP Hightech. JP is a global branding expert, speaker and media professional. As the CEO of Perfect Zone Productions, JP has embedded his mark as an influential leader in the personal branding and creative space. JP has redefined the term brand to reach beyond business, helping individuals, organizations and small business owners discover and embody their personal trademarked identity. A multi-talented cinematographer, software developer and technology solutionist, he is the president of Reveal TV Network and the founder and host of Content Creators University. Indeed, it was through the Content Creators University that I first got to know JP. I've learned so much from all of the guests that he's had on his show, and I've been very honored to have been a guest there myself. One of the things that immediately struck me about JP was his attention to detail. His company, Perfect Zone Productions, is very aptly named because if you watch any of his shows or see any of his content, you'll immediately see that the production quality is frankly just on another level. It's not just the design aesthetic, it's everything from the guest onboarding process to his run of show to the promotional segments throughout the show and of course, all of the graphics that go along with it. What can I say? The man has immense talent, so who better than to kick off this first full episode of the live streamer backstage podcast. We can all learn a lot from this man. So without further ado, let me say a big welcome. JP, it is absolutely wonderful to have you here with me today. Hey, 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 yeah, Alec. What's going on, family? I'm excited to be here. Thanks for the invite. Uh, so, so, so happy that you've launched this new podcast and looking forward to connecting and sharing some expertise as well here. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Thanks. Thanks so much for being here. As I say, you've been uh, a big inspiration. And uh, yeah, I've tried to uh, try to <laughs> aim for some of your production quality that you have in your shows. It's really, really awesome. And I mean, I titled the uh, the, the episode of this podcast, uh, brand, you know, live streaming for brand awareness. And I'm sure you're going to have some great insights into how people can uh, use live streaming as a tool to build brand uh, awareness. Um, but we're not just going to be limited to that topic. Of course, I mentioned in the intro that your content always looks amazing. So a little bit later i'm also looking forward to you sharing any that. tips you've got in how people can look their best on camera and level up their screen presence and of course what conversation between two live streamers wouldn't be complete without talking a little bit about the tech so we'll be taking a look at your tech. live streaming setup <laughs> as well uh, absolutely but, but first though i'm just always interested in to hear about people's uh, sort of uh, origin stories how they got into live streaming so perhaps you can give us a little bit about your background how did you first get into uh, live streaming Oh, nice. Nice. Great question. Um, actually, live stream um, as all right, we're in 2022. So it is about eight years now that I actually started doing live stream live stream uh -huh. um, because I've been I've been, you know, producing for a long time. My background is cinematography, uh, graphic design, web design, then, you know, uh, video production, uh, software development and things like that. So when I started with cinematography, that was the focus, right? Creating, uh, you know, story and and publishing that and, and, and helping clients tell the story in a unique way um, as they're trying to push their brands, all right? And, and their businesses create that awareness around that. Um, so that was my focus. And then at the same time, while I was growing my company, I was also on YouTube, right? Since 2015. So I was, um, you know, I had different YouTube channels. Um, and so as I was growing those YouTube channels, of course, my community, once you reach 50,000 subscribers uh, back then, uh, they were asking more of me. So the idea behind it was, okay, what will be the best engagement tool that I could use, right? To connect with my followers and my community. And I was like, you know what, let me just be going live. So that brought in going live into uh, the whole content creation thing that I was doing. Mm -hmm. uh, but on the professional, you know, uh, sphere, um, I was, you know, I have a TV broadcast background. So, um, you know, I'm the president of a TV network called Reveal TV Network uh, that, you know, owns five TV stations. And there we broadcast 24-7. So right there, you know, we use different softwares that are like Wirecast and, and different solutions to go live. So that I started doing that, right, professionally. Um, and then that transitioned to the YouTube, using the YouTube solutions and other, you know, tools to go live. And, you know, a couple of years ago, um, that, you know, that journey brought me all the way to Ecamm because I was searching for the best solution because that's who I am, right? I'm always trying to look for what can be the best way to do what I'm doing, not just the best way, but the, one of the easiest ways mm -hmm. that I could do it, right? Like without losing quality, maintaining the high 
in production, but without having to jump through too many hoops. And um, I came across Ecamm Live, joined the community, downloaded the software, and I can tell you, I'm a fan. I've been using it ever since. So that is my uh, quote unquote background and story how I got into live streaming. Uh huh. Yeah. Well, you know, I'm a, a huge fan of Ecamm as well. <laughs> it's uh, yes, it, sir. It, it really is a. Uh, it, it's been an, an enabler for me. You know, it sort of allows me to do what I'm doing in uh, in live streaming too. So, <laughs> uh, how have you yeah. seen that um, the sort of live streaming space has changed over all those years that you've been uh, doing this? What would you say is uh, sort of different now, or how how do you feel it's sort of changed in that time? Well, hey, live streaming has drastically changed, right? Like I mentioned earlier, I do have a broadcasting background. So I've seen the days where uh, to do what we're doing right now, you have to spend a whole lot of money. And I'm not talking $10,000, $20,000. I'm talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. And not only that, you will be requiring a team to help mm -hmm. you accomplish half of the stuff that we're able to do today, right? Just at a push button using, you know, tools like Stream Deck, which yep. we can talk about and show that in this live. Uh -huh. um, but stuff like Shrimp Deck, um, you know, uh, just allows you to do amazing stuff. And having a software like this where technology has gone so far today, where today all you need is download and install an encoder onto your computer, right? And having the destinations that, you know, you want to broadcast to and simply link an account and mm -hmm. hit go live simply amazing and also talking about um the easy way of going live there is also a way where you can simply go live using your phone phones yeah. now have the quality that are decent enough broadcasting in 1080p where you can simply grab your iphone right have a nice light setup put it maybe on a phone trap or anything and you can still do a good quality live stream back then we didn't have that right 20, 30 years ago, we didn't have all of this. And even if we had we had the ability, capability of doing so, like I said, it will be breaking the bank. So one thing that I love about how live streaming has grown is how accessible it is to the everyday Joe, right? Um, literally anybody can grow their brand by going live without yep. spending an arm and a leg. So that's something that I truly appreciate. I'm excited for the future of live streaming. Mm -hmm. I think it's uh, it's interesting when you come from a background like you've got where you actually know how much this sort of stuff used to cost, then you've got a really oh, uh, yeah. a deeper appreciation for it. And it's often funny to me when you see people who have, just, you know, maybe got zero experience whatsoever and just starting, uh, and then maybe sometimes complaining about little things that they can or can't do, and you think, do you actually realize how much you can already do and like how amazing you know, <laughs> this, this, this stuff is? But it's funny you were talking no, about uh, yeah. Um, the uh, like Yeah, the I was going to interject. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I was going to interject that because that made me think about one thing, right? Uh, when I was in college, University of Texas, Arlington, um, and we were in their TV studio. Right? I was a student and I, I, I used to love this stuff, right? I'm a tech. And people call me the tech nerd, right? Because I'm all about <laughs> tech. Yeah. Hence the name JP High Tech, folks, if you didn't know that. <laughs> uh, so um, I was in TV studio, you know, those big cameras, right, that they have in traditional TV studios. Yep. They're heavy. So I was learning, you know, the different tools, how to, you know, uh, how to point and have a close shot and, and full body shot and interview and all this amazing stuff you do uh, in TV production. And I, I asked my professor, I was like, hey, how much do you will do say camera like this because i mean the, it looks expensive i was like how much do you think this costs <laughs> yeah. so my professor uh he smiled and said you know what jp um it's in the ballpark of sixty thousand dollars and more i'm like whoa that's crazy <laughs> yeah you know like and, and we they had like four Right, we had right. four in the studio, uh -huh. um, and I asked him if this was required. He said, well, and again, that this was a long time ago, right? He said, yes, it was required in the studio to have a certain image quality and also to have certain ports, right? Because uh, if you know anything about professional broadcasting, you want the SDI ports, you want yep. everything in order to have the full length, you know, full level production for a TV broadcast. Uh -huh. So not every camera can do that. Even still today, the mirrorless cameras or, you know, the uh, SLR cameras and those small cameras that we use, the one I'm using right now, doesn't have all those ports, but it doesn't cost sixty thousand dollars. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a, a lot more accessible. <laughs> exactly. So yeah, there you go, man. I'm I'm really excited about that. And yeah, we've we live in a different world today where literally you can really make a huge impact if you know exactly what to do, the tools to buy, how to put it together, and be intentional about your brand, man, you can really 
killer today. Yeah, I noticed uh, just, was it yesterday or the day before, uh, YOLO, who make the uh, YOLO box and YOLO Pro, which are kind of an all-in-one little streaming device, uh, they've just released a new uh, product, which is uh, basically built for vertical. So um, uh, you can stream to TikTok and Instagram uh, f- directly from the device, which is uh, really interesting, because I know a lot of people want to stream to Instagram from some of these desktop clients, and it's not quite possible at the moment, uh, because of the uh, logis- uh, the the uh, terms of service basically for Instagram whereas this because it comes across as a mobile device you can basically still just stream to it so it's really interesting how um yeah just all of these platforms are <laughs> are developing and growing in this way yeah yeah I mean I saw that and I was I was impressed how a uh, YOLO they just had it and had a broadcasting camera linked it into via the HDMI of the camera and that little device li- literally uh works as a phone but yeah. it, it is a dedicated you know encoder for you so yeah. you literally connect into your um, Instagram account and that replaces your phone like you said right because uh not like other destinations that give you the RTMP uh destinations that you can use mm-hmm. while well, current to Instagram terms of service they do not want you to do that even though yep. they're uh yellow duck and other folks that are using to do that according to instagram don't do it yep. if you don't want to reach to lose your account so i love that they have a device like that and that goes again to what we're talking about right the ease of use or the uh uh how reachable it is yes, yeah. to do stuff like that. And if you know anything about the yellow box, it's not that expensive either. Uh, uh-huh. You buy it, and um, except there's something called IRL, you know, stream, which means um, in real live streaming. So if you know anything about that, that's a different type of streaming word. For example, there's a game, football game, or, you know, I don't know, something that away from the studio, mm-hmm. you need IRL solutions in order to go live. And that yellow box is an IRL solution that will allow you to literally you can the traditional studio set and still maintain high quality um, and be able to you know show people high quality content audio and video so beautiful stuff man yes sir uh-huh. <laughs> um so why don't we uh, have a little chat then about um how you've used uh, live streaming for your brand but then also how you recommend people using it for theirs and i know that you've worked with a number of uh, live streamers you know as clients but obviously you're working with people who aren't just live streamers you work with uh, everybody. Uh, but how, how do you see people sort of from a live streaming point of view using this and as a tool and, and what sort of advice have you got for people who are thinking about that kind of thing? Great question, man. Great question. So um, in my career, for the folks that do not know, um, you know, I help, you know, individuals, entities, small or large corporations um, make an impact by creating premium brand. And we leverage one of the tools that we leverage um, is live stream to do that. Right. Um, so one thing that I've learned is that live stream is pretty much one of the secret, uh, you know, solutions uh, or tools that you can use to grow your brand rapidly, right? Now you can definitely use traditional videos and content creation and and stuff like that to bring that brand awareness uh, through all the tools we have today. We have so many uh, platforms today to help uh, put your brand out there, promote the name of your business, and you know, pretty much show what you do. Um, But live stream creates a different, you know, way, allowing people to have a unique experience. So literally, when you understand the power of live stream, live stream allows you to tell your story in the time you choose to tell it. Literally, we're going live right now. And we chose that time, you chose the time to go live, which means that you're literally holding the conversation in a time that you're controlling. So you're bringing the traffic, which is called intentional targeted traffic, you're bringing that into a specific time, right, where you want to gather um, like-minded people that will have a unique experience. Like we already know, live video, right, can be consumed later as an on-demand content, right? But whenever it's live, now is allowing you, the viewer, to have a one-on-one interaction right, per se, with the broadcaster. So that allows you to be part of something that's bigger than you, knowing that there's a whole, you know, uh, a, a list of people, a lot of people connecting as a community, coming together under one cause. Same way, right, whenever we're watching TV, we have live tv on different channels cnn and all of that a whole lot of people watch those things even though they can you know get the information later there's something unique about the time in which they're getting that information right people want the information when it's taking place now so if you want to get that now and tap into the now of the information that's been released then live is the only way to do that and so when we're talking about businesses 
businesses can now evolve in a unique way where they can now demonstrate because branding is the ability to show people what you do, right? How, right? The how of what you do. So not just what you do, but how do you do it? People want to know the backstage, the backstory of the great things you're doing. So as you're, you're a business owner and you're leveraging live, now you can hold unique conversations where now you can target that uh, engagement where people come in and they're asking questions about the brand that they want to consume. And they want to understand how is it you're doing that? What is the beauty of this? And certain questions some people will never ask unless they're, they're live with you, right? And that is the beauty of it because that allows you now to tap into some conversations that you never have. And we, if we understand anything about engagement, um, companies are spending millions of dollars just to purchase data for engagement and try to leverage that in order to reach their communities because it's all about what the consumer wants, what the consumer is thinking, and what they're trying to do with your product that you're releasing. So once you can get that private insight from them, well, guess what? You have a head, uh, you know, one step ahead of competition. So that is how uh, live stream has helped me, right? That's the angle that I look at it. And to be honest with you, it's helped me grow tremendously. Like my business has grown a lot just by going live. And there's a community of people that I will have never been able to connect with, grow with, and, you know, serve because that's what we do right when you have a product or service you're looking to serve and so there are certain questions certain feedback and certain conversations that i will have never been able to hold if I, I wasn't going live so live did that for me and i'm grateful that we have the ability today uh to tap into it in order to grow our businesses mm -hmm. it's really interesting you mentioned the thing about uh like the there's something special about being live and i know from like a, a viewer's point of view when you see that something is live, you do get that uh, that sort of FOMO <laughs> if you feel like you're not going to be there yep. on the actual live stream. It's even though you know mm -hmm. you can go back and watch it later, it does have that sort of uh, that that pull to to, to draw people in. Uh, and yeah, certainly sort of bridging that gap, you know, between just advertising, people becoming aware of you, but then getting to uh, uh, getting to getting to know you really uh, uh, more sort of as you say the, the sort of behind the scenes and getting to know the people behind you know who they're going to be uh, potentially interacting with from a from a business point of view. And also one thing that is, uh, uh, I believe, uh, I didn't mean to cut you, but one thing that I believe is very important that we should mention when it comes out to live is that it's not overcrowded yet. Mm -hmm. As you know, a lot of folks talk about, oh man, can I start YouTube? Can I start content creation or, you know, uh -huh. full time and doing stuff like that? And we know people have been doing that for years, right? There are billions of videos that are released, you know, uh, every single week on YouTube. Well, there, we, we're not getting billions of live streamers going live every single week, right? <laughs> yeah. So if we want to talk about the benefit, right? One benefit is you can cut through, you know, the competition, cut through the crowd just by going live versus pre-recorded video. So that is very, very important to think about because if you decide to go live, then that means that you have a strategy of impact, I call it, right? You have a strategy and you, that is a strategy that you're using to be discovered faster because you really want to be discovered. And there's a lot of competition out there. So how is it that you can really put your best foot forward and have your brand being discovered and drawing the traffic towards you that you can leverage that and convert that into clientele? Live stream does that for you, right? And just like how uh, my man, Alex says all the time, if you didn't know, and I know that, is less work. Because a lot of folks talk about, oh, you got to, you know, go back later, edit the video and, <laughs> and try to, you know, post produce. One thing that Alex loves is one take, like literally it's done published and we're good but honestly there we have softwares now like he live that allows you to really organize before you go live you organize mm -hmm. your production and That's as you it. organize everything you have literally have the ability to go live and make it look like it was already edited and mm -hmm. once you're done you publish the video so that saves you a lot of time right because if you think about it, most people today don't have time. They're looking for what tool can I use that can complement my life and make my life easier that will allow me to do things quicker, faster with a better turnaround time. Well, guess what? Live stream allows you to do that, right? So it, it allows you to take less time to produce the things that you're producing. And guys, the ability to repurpose your content is the last thing I'm gonna give you, right? Repurposing your content, not just as a live stream, 
But now you have a pre-recorded video that you can use now, repurpose that to start new conversations and to reach new audiences and to grow your income. So think about that. That's one thing that, you know, a lot of folks don't think about. And I love that about live stream. It really allows us to do a lot. Mm -hmm. and, and, but you, you mentioned a couple of platforms there. I'm just curious to know, like when you're working with a client, how do you uh, talk with them about, you know, different platforms and what, where do you see these sort of differentiation there between, uh, you know, obviously we've got, we're, we're live now to LinkedIn and Amazon, but then there's YouTube, Twitch, uh, Instagram that we've mentioned already, places like that. Um, mm -hmm. where, where do you see that? And I, I also was um, uh, interested when, uh, when I first became aware of you, the fact that you are repurposing it and you know obviously with your uh tv channels you are broadcasting mm -hmm. to uh, other different platforms there so i'm interested in in uh first of all how you uh how, how you go about doing that and how uh, how you decide where to put different types of content absolutely my great question man you're laying amazing questions on me today that's really really <laughs> I'm awesome here, i'm here to learn that's right <laughs> hey let's do it man let's yeah, do yeah. it uh, awesome so one thing that we need to understand in life is that ownership is everything right? Ownership is what allows you to hold certain conversation. If you really want to uh, establish your mark in this world, you got to be able to own your own real estate. So a lot of times I've realized that a lot of content creators do not think about the ownership aspect of their content creation journey. All the uh, most people want to think about is simply broadcasting. Well, here's the reality. Whenever you broadcast to places like YouTube, Facebook, you know, Instagram and all of that, you don't own anything because they own the platform. They're just giving you, uh, you know, the ability to broadcast there. Even if you have 10 million subscribers, you do not own anything. Meaning mm -hmm. they can decide to take all everything you've done, right? Your work, right? everything you put in for years and years and years, you can destroy that in one day. Mm -hmm. They can delete it. And they've done to multiple multiple people and i'm one of them right so i have a channel i lost it when it reached 120 something thousand subscribers in youtube so now that changed the philosophy so whenever sure. i'm working with a client I, I laid the honest foundation down to let them know this is something you need to care about because you're here you're about to spend a lot of money a lot of time you're about to invest a lot of a lot of things into growing your brand with live you need to think about ownership that's why I love real estate or investing, right? Because it does grow me money. I own it, right? Nobody can take it away from me. Mm -hmm. It's me. And not only after you own it, there's something called your brand net worth, right? Mm -hmm. What's the net worth of your brand? Because we understand the brand will have a value when it starts. But as you're growing, as you're building those assets, as you're acquiring those different assets, right, for your brand now you will have a brand net worth and that's what will separate you from a, a starter uh somebody that's starting today and you have been doing it for 10 20 plus years and when we're talking about content creators uh i do get brand deals right um but i don't struggle to get those brand deals like some fellows amazing creators of mine that i know struggle to get them mm -hmm. and that is because of the value the net worth that you have because whenever people are looking at what exactly do you have to offer, right? What is the value of all the things you have? Well, depending on the assets that you own, and that's just, it works across any business. Anything that you do, depending on the assets that you own, the value is attached to it, right? So now, talking about ownership, one way of owning your thing is by being on TV, right? Mm -hmm. I quickly understood that because I've learned the hard way by losing my platform and having to come back and reinvent myself, right? Uh -huh. So. Now I'm on TV. I have my Roku TV application and I have my Fire TV application. Now I'm using a solution called RTN Streams, right? And you guys can go to the website. It's rtnstreams.com. That allows me now to tap into ownership that I didn't have before. So now whenever I'm going live on all those amazing platforms, YouTube, social media, and all of that, well, I am redirecting the traffic, right? My community knows about that. And I'm redirecting the traffic to a platform that I own, mm -hmm. I control, and I make the rules there, which means that there will be certain, certain things that I'll be able to do on TV, on my Roku TV application mm -hmm. that I, I'm not allowed to do on YouTube because YouTube has their own guidelines. Instagram sure. have their own policy and mm -hmm. all those platforms have their own policies, right? So if anything were to happen to any of my platform, all the work that I have, I will have, I will have put in for the past two, three, four, five years will not be lost because I own something. So mm -hmm. my community, my followers, 
know where to go to find me versus losing everything and having to start back from scratch, which is crucial. Not only that, though, you want to also look at, because just for the folks that are listening or watching this, my app name is JP High Tech TV, okay? JP High Tech TV, H I G H T K TV, both on Fire TV, Roku TV, and also I have my mobile application. Go to your iPhone, download it right there. It's free. One thing that I love about this is talking about brand net worth. Now, whenever you're searching for the brand name called JP High Tech, now you're going to find me on all those platforms. You're going to find me on Roku, on uh, you know, Fire TV, and all those platforms. And when you search my competition, remember, so as we're searching for competition, that is something that, um, that we want to think about because, okay, I'm back. <laughs> you might, you might, you're all right, so that's something that we want to uh -huh. think about because as we're thinking about competition, competition is there, whether we like it or not. It will always be there, right? So how is it that you can come ahead of your competition? What are the things that you put in place to beat your competition? That's very important. So as a brand comes to you, as a brand you know, sponsor uh, comes to you, they, they want to really sponsor you. If you tell them, just like most content creators, that, yeah, I have my YouTube channel, I'm on social media and all of that. Well, guess what? Not even not creators, uh, you know, influencers they're talking to have the same thing. But, you know, well, have their own applications. So they don't have ownership um, of the things that they're supposed to have. So by you presenting the ownership, it taps into a different conversation and it allows you to charge more for the, you know, the deal that you're about sure. to have. Mm -hmm. And that is the beauty of everything that I'm talking about here about building your brand and going live. That is such a smart move. And I'm, I, it's something I need to look into myself because I was on my, uh, my YouTube channel. Uh, there was a video that I posted. I didn't realize it had crossed any guidelines or anything like that. Uh, but then the YouTube took it down and I got like a little, a little cross next to my, uh, my channel name thinking like, Oh, well, I've only got two more of these or three more of these, whatever it is. And it makes you feel instantly like, oh, hang on a minute. <laughs> these, I'm, uh, I'm uh, under the control of uh, somebody else here. So, yeah, I mean, that was one of the things that uh, when I uh, first found the uh, Content Creators University, it was the fact that it was, you know, also on TV channels as well as the, the regular <laughs> streaming platforms that uh, was something that I found really, uh, really interesting. So uh, thanks for thanks for sharing all that. I just want to check in with uh, with Amazon. Actually, we've got quite a few people on the Amazon side uh, saying absolutely. Hi. But before we do that, I just want to take a moment to talk about Ecamm Live because Ecamm Live is the software that we are using to live stream and record this podcast. It is live streaming and live production software for the Mac. And in my estimation, it is hands down uh, the best software on the market for this job. It is so easy to use, it is so intuitive. And what does it do? Well, it allows you to create multiple different scenes with different layouts. So you might have different camera angles that you want to be able to flick back and forth between in your live stream or in your videos. Uh, you can incorporate guests, obviously, as we're doing now. So it has an interview feature built in where you can bring in multiple different guests and incorporate their camera feeds onto the screen. It also allows you to do screen sharing as well. So uh, the majority of my videos on my uh, YouTube channel, well, they're all actually tutorial style videos. Uh, so it allows me to do all of those sharing different parts of the screen zooming in on different areas that i want to highlight and all that that kind of thing uh, and so i would say that actually without a doubt ecamm live has enabled my take one tech youtube channel because as the name might suggest uh, the take one is that they're all done in a single take uh, rather than any editing involved so i just literally sit down hit the record button and then go through the tutorial whatever it is, is i want to demonstrate and then at the end when i hit the end button I've got a video all ready to upload to YouTube. And indeed, it's the same with this. We've got the podcast all ready to go at the end once we've uh, once we've finished. One of the great things about Ecamm, specifically for podcasts, is as well as all the great video aspects to it, it's also got the possibility to record isolated audio tracks. So it means that at the end of the recording, we're going to have a separate track for myself, the guests, and also for any other audio that was played throughout it. So for any podcasters out there, it's also a great tool and a great way to actually record your interview style podcasts as well. I highly recommend it. You can get a free trial by going to takeonetech.io slash Ecamm. You will not regret 
regret giving it a go. I tried uh, all of the other options. There are some other software options that sit on your computer. There's obviously web-based options as well, but hands down for me, the quality of production that you can create with Ecamm is just on another level to all of those. So I highly recommend, as I say, checking it out, takeonetech.io slash Ecamm. So let's just get back to the Amazon side and uh, we've got a few good uh, questions coming in. So uh, hi to everyone over there. Hi, L. Hi, John as well. Live is the way. Live is where it's all at. So obviously we've got lots of uh, live streamer friends in here. Nicole, how are you from California? It draws the viewer back as well. So that is another point about live. You know, when you feel like you're you're actually building a community and part of the thing that uh, that I find about being on on viewing live streams is there's kind of like a whole series of uh, or whole whole side of sort of banter if you like or back chat that's going on like in the in the chat as well where you know you you it's, it's kind of like hanging out with friends watching uh, your favorite creator so there's that aspect aspect to it as well absolutely um, yep uh, and it's all about uh, making your mark, L says. And uh, somebody's saying about, um, is it okay to start with a, a USB mic? We'll come on to um, uh, onto, uh, gear a little bit later. But um, yeah, it'd be interesting to know, like when you started out, um, how did you, uh, you know, what, what did you use? Did you, uh, did you go out and build out a dream studio from the outset? Or was it something that uh, sort of built up uh, over time? <laughs> and I think this is a bit of a leading question because I kind of, <laughs> I think. I know, right? <laughs> 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 great question when i started of course i didn't start with everything that i have right now in my studio uh my first as a matter of fact talking about microphone my first microphone was a usb my microphone it was a blue uh mm -hmm. yeti that i you know i purchased mm -hmm. and of course being you know the quote-unquote perfectionist that i am i didn't like it like i really didn't i was like no this is not what i was looking for uh but i was trying to save money and i purchased that and also you know with a usb microphone i, I got into a whole lot of trouble that you get with a USB microphone, if you didn't know that, uh, because it's USB, then it's overloading the ports that you have, right, on on your on your computer. And once that USB port is overloaded, you might have something called, you know, down, you know, uh, losing audio. So you have some down frames if you're doing video and audio, you'll be losing uh, input. So if we go in and now, or your, the sound quality will decrease uh, because it's just overheating or it's just, you know, the the process on your computer is affecting it. I had to learn that the hard way, and I. I decided no more I, I didn't want to do any USB microphone so I started using XLR microphones right um, and so when you talk about XLR microphones I've gone the route of uh, what a lot of folks appreciate which is Rode right uh, Rode microphone um, was fantastic for me and even in the studio right now I do have that we'll talk about I'll show you guys in a little bit what I have in here but that changed everything. But of course, when we're talking about XLR microphones, you do need a um, audio interface to do that. Um, today, of course, I'm using the Rode, but um, I started with the M Audio, right? M Audio, which is about hundred and some dollars, you know, with the Pod Mic, which is also about hundred bucks, didn't break the bank for me, and that gave me crystal clear audio quality that I was looking for. I was able to tweak that in, which is crucial because when it comes down to audio. Audio is even more important than your, the, the quality of your camera. The first thing you want to think about is your audio first, right? And then upgrade the, the lens or the camera that you have. People will be comfortable with you having an okay, you know, video with an amazing audio, but they will not be happy with you having an amazing video with a terrible audio. Uh, because remember, they want to be able to hear you. So if they're having a hard time hearing you, they're not going to stay on your stream. They're just going to keep moving um, and, and go find somebody else that they can actually listen to and hear what they're saying. So that, uh, you know, that was my experience there. And, you know, I started adding more and more to my studio because, of course, everybody got a starting point. But I embraced the journey and I was able to learn a whole lot of different things. And then today, um, you know, I help other people. I build their, We help build their studio with my company, Perfectly in Productions. We build their studio and help them have an amazing setup but not every setup is for everyone i always say that right it's not everything that i have that will be good for you and it's not the stuff that you have that will be good for me so it's always good to um, understand work with a professional right that will help you understand the use um, and the power of every single tech that you purchase and put in your studio what's the strength and what are the weaknesses of this and how can that uh, complement me my business, the type of, you know, production that I want to put together, you know, and some people, they have multi-camera setup, right? I don't necessarily do multi-camera setup. Uh, I have 
plant several cameras. <laughs> but I was like, I don't see the need of it. Um, if I want to show a product or anything like that, I might go ahead and do that. But it's not for what I usually do, right? I don't really need that. So it's all about, you know, understanding the tech, what it can do for you, how you can use it, you know, and maximize your investment um, and then take advantage of it. So, yes, sir, that is how I was able to, you know, accumulate the things that I have today and, and, and get to this quality of production that I have. Mm -hmm. And when you're uh, working with clients then uh, and helping them with their studio setup, where would you suggest somebody uh, somebody uh, would start with something like that? Or how do you go about assessing the, the needs of, of somebody in that respect? Good question. The way I do it is, first of all, understanding their business needs, right? What type of business do you have? What are your needs through live video, right? What are you trying to accomplish with the live video? We need to determine that. And then with that, that allows me to help you build the studio that will work with uh, for you, right? Of course, we're gonna talk about, like I just said, uh, what type of production are we trying to put together? Are you gonna be uh, one head talking head? Are you gonna have like a guest with you every time you're doing your podcast? Or do you want like an audio podcast feel? Are you gonna be saving that, extracting the audio to be you know, producing an audio podcast? What exactly are you gonna be doing now? From there, that allows me to tell you specifically what type of gear will work the best for you now of course i always present um businesses with decent not basic setup but decent meaning medium to high because those are businesses and when we're talking about businesses they've been in business for a while already they're not starting up they have a clientele and so they're usually more than likely trying to elevate when they come to me right uh because most clients that i get they already know that they can do basic live stream with their phone or with a tablet and all those basic stuff they don't come to jp to learn the basic stuff they come to jp to truly elevate so when they come to me my company helps them actually elevate make them look premium right because yeah. one thing they understood is yes it's good like i would say it's good to start with what you have mm -hmm. but it is not good to stay with what you have uh -huh. we should all aspire to sure. improve you cannot start today right in a certain way seven years later you are the same level no growth no improvement that's terrible right terrible you need to aspire to grow so that is one thing that i say and when it comes out to business i always tell them that okay the way you present yourself will determine how people react with your brand that is very, very important. If you're looking for people to spend, uh, you know, your average sale, for example, is like seven hundred dollars to you know five thousand. That's a lot of money if you have products you're selling, and the minimum uh, price somebody can spend in your store is seven hundred dollars. You probably want to spend some decent amount of money in your live stream so that when you're speaking to people, they can see that you've invested in yourself. Because if I have to spend a lot of money buying your product and you're doing a live stream and I'm looking at you, it looks terrible. I'm like, um, you're not taking yourself seriously. I'm not going to go ahead and yeah, I'm not even going to listen to you. That's very important. Right. So those things you want to also uh, leverage that and understand that we are in the market where there's competition. Right. So as we have competition, we have ways to try to overcome the competition. And one way that you can really overcome the competition is by having a stellar production. Mm -hmm. Whenever you have a stellar top of the line production, the skeptical, I would say, are halfway there. Like they're, they're, they might be skeptical, but they will wait. Yep. And they will try to listen to what you're talking about because I'm like, you know what? This production is really good. <laughs> uh, let me listen to what you know you have to say. And if what you're saying is good, because you got to do the rest, right? You really got to um, hold that attention, right? Uh, retention is big on YouTube. So uh, if you can grab their attention, guess what? There will be a client or at least they'll start following you. And once they're sold, they'll spend money with you. So that's the whole you know, concept there. Mm -hmm. And I, one of the things you, you talk there about, you know, looking good on, uh, on camera and we're talking about gear as well. But there's one thing where a lot of people will have, you know, a great quality camera or setup and things like that, but they're not actually getting the best out of the gear that they've already got. Uh, and I know that one uh -huh. of the things that you do is uh, provide uh, LUTs. So I'll be interested to know exactly explain what those are and how those work. But there's something I've noticed about people who have come to you for their LUTs. Then when I see them on screen, like the before and after, I think, oh, they've got that, that <laughs> JP shine to it where it just looks so polished. And uh, it's, it, it, it really sort of transforms what they've even already got in their studio. So perhaps you can talk a little bit to that. And, you know, what is a LUT and how, and how does it work? And, and how do you go about providing that kind of thing? 
Well, great question, man. A LUT, for the folks that do not know, um, is used in cinematography. And LUT stands for lookup table, right? So that is what you apply to videos in post-production to um, do color correction to it. It's literally a color correction uh, whenever you're doing, you know, you're going into your software and you're color correcting your footage for it to look amazing, for it to pop on the camera. You, you know, you apply that and uh, professionals in, in cinema have their own custom LUT, like they'll create that LUT and save it so that they can have a constant look every single time they produce something. So when we're talking about branding, it is important to look similar like have a consistent look every single time you go live, regardless of where you are, right? Um, that is important. And also understanding that a LUT has to do with a lot of different things. It has to do with the uh, primary colors, the secondary colors, uh, you know, the dominant colors in your studio, the skin tone that you have. Is it indoor? Is it outdoor? All of that matters. It will affect your LUT. Now, I always um, recommend anybody that's trying to do this professional live streaming to think about having a LUT because if you're just depending on the colors and the camera, you are not going to look all the way there. You look decent, but it's not going to be all, all the way there. So for example, I have a LUT on right now. My LUT is on 90%. I'm about to go ahead and remove my LUT, pay attention on my video right now. So this is what I look like, right? So I'm about to de slowly remove my LUT, right? So look at mm -hmm. the colors right now. This is These are the colors on my camera, right? It looks decent, but it's not popping, mm, right? I have a good camera and good lens, but it's not popping. It looks kind of dull, right? Um, but whenever I bring the LUT, pay attention, as the LUT comes back, you will see that now I will start popping. Look at that. I'm back to live. So the LUT transforms and brings you back to live. It makes you pop from the background. And ultimately, it makes you look very, very good on camera, right? Because it, it brings out the true tone. The blacks are going to be true black. Uh, your skin tone, the colors of your lighting, the reds, the blue, and all of that that you have, those amazing colors are going to start popping. So that's what we do for people. And we allow them, you know, we create custom LUTs for a whole lot of creators, right? And you're right. Every single time they add their custom LUT, I say custom because you can get standard LUT um out there online so somebody asked me one time jp why can't i just go and purchase a standard lut out there that they're selling online for 30 40 bucks and i apply it on my video the question is that lut that you're buying was not created with you in mind it was created with somebody else in mind it was probably maybe created um for when you're shooting under the heavy harsh sun so if you apply that to your image heavy harsh sun so that will cause problem uh with the things that you're doing so that's very important so think about uh what you and also about your skin tone that love wasn't created with you in mind they didn't take your specific skin tone your specific lighting scenario your specific setup and tweak the colors to you know, create the mood that you're looking for whenever you're creating a lot you can create different mood you can create dramatic you can create you know uh romantic you can create a corporate feel. You can create a whole lot of different feels whenever you're creating the LUT, right? It's all about the story that you're trying to tell. What mood are you trying to push out when people are watching you, right? So that's what we do. Like we take the time and create that specific mood and ultimately help you really Im impact people in a unique way. As they look at you, you want people to be like, wow, this is amazing. So that's what a LUT does for you. And yeah, that's what we do for the folks that are looking to get a LUT. They can always just go to my website, jpitech.com uh, forward slash custom LUT, and they'll be able to get that. So here's the website on the top right there. Um, if you go to booking, um, you'll be able to see that. Um, yeah, I'm booking right there. Uh, there will be a drop down whenever you, you know, try to click on it. And then it will allow you to, you know, go and get your custom blood or you can go directly to the you know url jpitech.com for a search custom blood and it will allow you to get that and the beauty is it doesn't break the bank only about 40 some dollars you have your own custom blood how beautiful is that so <laughs> that's amazing but yeah that, there you go man i hope i answered your question yeah thank you so much and and
you can always tell when somebody's been and had their luck done <laughs> with you like, made for them because it's just, just seen the the difference there that you could uh, show so uh, for audio listeners <laughs> if you can uh, uh, check out the replay or maybe i'll drop a picture in of the sort of before and after because the, the the transformation there is really just uh well, it's, it's, it's just it is a transformation <laughs> so uh, thanks uh, exactly thanks, uh, thanks for sharing that um I'd be, I'd be interesting to dive into uh your studio setup now though a little bit um because we talked right. about the the luts and getting and you know i always like to talk about the tech and the gear so i can bring <laughs> up a little uh a picture so i'll leave this in the uh, show notes for those that are watching on the uh, or listening rather in the uh, in the audio uh, i've left mm-hmm. a link to uh, this this image but perhaps you can just sort of kind of talk through uh what you're using now and maybe a little bit about the sort of evolution of it as well Absolutely. So um, if you're watching it, well, welcome, because now you're taking a look at my setup. And in my setup here, um, the number one thing that I want to talk about are lighting. Lighting does literally, if you understand lighting, you don't really have to spend money on super expensive cameras. If you can understand the mastery of your lighting, you will be able to do a whole, whole lot of stuff. So right there, I have an Ameren uh, 100 on the left. I have another Amaron 200 on the top and I have an SLW 60 on the right hand side. Now, you notice that I'm using soft boxes, right? Why am I not using um, anything else but soft boxes? Well, remember, I'm a cinematographer, so I understand that whenever you want to have a soft skin, right, you don't want your light to hit you harsh and you want to look smooth and very nice on camera you want to use a soft box and the size of the type of soft box that you get will determine, you know, how smooth your skin is. So that's what I have. Um, you know, I have a 32 inch soft box on the Amra 100 on the top. I have another 34 inch and on the right hand side, I have uh, a 42 or 45 inch right there. There's a gold W that allows me to really illuminate my scene very clearly. Cause, um, if you notice, if you're watching this show, you notice that my background right in my studio is darker than my foreground. So that allows me to separate myself clearly from my background and also create that mood because I have a lot of colors happening. Um, you see red, you see blue shining on, on my head, right? And then you have um, other colors um, on my background on the shelves there. So what I wanted to do is have that unique solid color on my face and still having those colors pop in the background. And the way you can achieve that, the best way you can achieve that is through lighting. And lighting, here's the deal. Here's, here's a cheat sheet, folks. The better you can adjust and the better you can you will look, right? Of course, you can overcast it, but in general, when you have enough lighting, you can really have a great setup. But when you ha- you don't have enough lighting, now you're dealing with harsh shadows, right? Grainy footage and different things. That will be hard to tweak. So I always say, make sure you have enough lighting in the room that you're in. And it's always better to use a controlled light, a light that you can control, not necessarily a window, right? So the best way to do is shut down any window that you may have, any um, uncontrolled light, uh, the sun and all that. You can't control that, right? You can't control the intensity um, uh, whenever you want to. But these lights, I can control them with my, sorry about folks, at lek. So, right, I can control that with it, which is beautiful. I can also control it with my phone, which is amazing. So that makes my life a whole lot easier. Depending on the time of day, I can tweak it down, I can dim it down a little bit, I can increase it and all of that. And that allows me to have a consistent look every single time. So that is one reason why I have those. Now, another thing that I will show you guys that I have in my studio here. So let me go ahead and uh, put a live camera up in my studio so I can show you. So right here, you see in my studio that I have, one thing that I love is my audio system right here. And this is my Rode, uh, you know, Castor Pro. And this is the one right i love this device of course i used to have the m audio like i was telling you guys but the rollcaster pro gives me some bass gain and some tweaks additional tweaks a uh, mix and minus on the audio point that i can really tweak in exactly what i'm looking for and paired with this microphone that i'm using and this is my shore sm7b now with this uh, sm7b i get the best you know combination that you can think of because now i have the amount of bass that I want, I have the amount of treble that I want, and I can truly dial in exactly uh, whenever I'm, you know, I'm I'm, I'm here, I'm not talking loud, you can hear me clearly, Um, I don't have to be 
you know, uh, moving or try to position the microphone in front of me directly or anything like that. This allows me to do that. And also it allows me to control the environment, um, you know, audio sound off stage, right? So if anybody's walking right next to me, because of how I set it up, it mutes that. It doesn't bring that into the microphone. Whenever I start speaking, um, you're not going to hear anything. Check this out. As you can see, when I stop, clear silence, right? Even though there are people that are walking in the room right next door, right next to me, you won't be able to hear that. I wouldn't, I was not able to you know, tweak it and get this specific thing uh, with that my other um, audio system. So it is very important for me to get that. Why? Because I am also extracting the audio as an audio podcast whenever I'm doing my broadcast every week. So if you're, you know, you really want to have a crystal clear audio, this is something that I'll highly recommend the Rodecaster Pro. Now let's talk about more stuff that I have in my studio here. One thing that I'll tell you is, of course, my camera right there um, in front of me is my Sony A6100 paired with a 16 millimeter f1.8. For, um, you know, lens that I have right here. And the reason why I chose the 16 millimeter is because it allows me, I'm really at a, you know, arm's length. If you're watching this, you notice that I can touch my lens just by, you know, uh, raising my hand there or put it up straight, but it doesn't feel that I'm that close to the lens and something, there's something called bokeh effect. So if you want to have the bokeh effect, bokeh effect is literally um, being able to have, um, you know, blurry or some some type of blurry background, right? Uh, being able to have that and it allows you to separate yourself from the background is crucial. So um, if I, if you're watching this again, I want to encourage you if you listen to the podcast to come and check out the video. So you can see me clearly, right? Um, and you can still see my background, but you notice that my background is a little blurry compared to the foreground. The foreground is in perfect sharpness, but my background is a little blurry. That is what I'm able to achieve by using um, this lens, right? Paired with uh, my Sony camera. Now, a lot of folks will ask me, why not a different camera? Why this specific camera? One thing that I'll tell you is as long as your camera has a clean HDMI, you should be able to use that for live streaming. What do I mean by clean HDMI? Well, clean HDMI is a camera that does that allows you whenever you connect to HDMI, that allows you to remove all the information that you will have on the traditional camera screen, right? So it's clean. You don't have any writings or anything on the you know screen of the camera whenever you connect to via HDMI. So not every single camera does have that clean HDMI. So you want to have that. And this is one of the cameras that have that. Now, the beauty of it is with the clean HDMI, now you can do a whole lot of other stuff. You can use it for TV production, just like I'm doing right now, right? So I'm using that. However, one thing that I personally prefer about the Sony camera versus any other cameras, or let's say two cameras, so Sony, Canon, those are you know two very popular brands. Canon has more of a matte finish to their, you know, uh, their image quality. I personally prefer using Canon cinema cameras for, for my company, whenever we're doing broadcast work, uh, cinema work, we use that because it gives you that cinematic, uh, you know, matte finish, you know, with the log file, cine log that you can use in post-production and get tweaking down whenever you're doing your color correction to get exactly what you're looking for. But when it comes out to live video, Live video is all about popping on camera, especially I'm talking about indie producers, indie, mini, small producers, independent producers like us, you and me. Um, that is an aspect of things that you want to think about. If you want to have the all the pop as possible, um, of course, you can get, you know, tweak that on uh, the Canon camera to get us very close to this, but it will be more work. So the easiest way to get close to this will be using a Sony camera because they're more of a sharp pop color finish to it, right? Even though you, you have Sony cameras that will give you log files that can dial in, whenever you go into traditional, you know, uh, color profiles, it allows you to pop easy, easily compared to the Canon or other cameras that are out there. I also used to broadcast with my GH, uh, you know, Panasonic GH5 that I have. Um, and even though I dial in all the colors, it wasn't giving me something called true colors. True colors are something that are crucial when it comes up to videography. Uh, you want your black to be true black, red to be true red, because whenever you have the true colors, things will really pop. And why am I saying pop? Well, hey, pop in a minute. Uh, you look amazing on camera, right? Um, and it's only because everything is true color that you'll be able to pop the best on camera. And I've noticed based on my experience. And again, I've been doing this for over 15 years using cameras. I've learned that Sony 
allows me to do that. Um, so that's why I personally prefer Sony. But again, you can go live with any other camera that you have that has clean HDMI. It's a, a great points there. And uh, one thing I, I wanted to just add as well is about uh, the thing that you were talking about lighting and the importance of lighting, because a lot of people will spend a lot of time on their camera uh, trying to get the settings all right in there, but it's actually the lighting that is letting them down almost. Um, mm -hmm. And and the lighting can really transform, you know, even a uh, you know a, a sort of lower end camera to a, a great extent. Um, when I uh, started, I'd started with my uh, Canon EOS 60D, a 10 year old camera, and I'm still using it <laughs> because uh, it's uh, I've got a, an upgrade plan, but uh, it was originally the ZV E10, uh, and then they had that out of stock issue. But um, it's really the sort of lighting that has um, you know made this this look better and this is like you know a 10 year old thing so um coming back to a, a question that somebody asked in the uh, the amazon live earlier about you know is you know this bit of gear okay or that bit of gear um then mm -hmm. you know if you have got something that you've already got then it's it's interesting to sort of look at how you could start with what you've got and then sort of build up from from there forward but it's like you said if you're still uh, stuck where you are and not <laughs> not growing as well uh, then ha always have that sort of growth path in mind and those uh those extra steps that you can take to upgrade. And uh, I mean, my studio will be thing that I wanted to add to it. <clears throat> um, there's one thing that I wanted to add to what you're saying in regards to lighting. Let me go back to my setup here. Yep. Uh, one thing that I wanted to show the folks here is if you pay attention, you will notice that my table is white. Now, anybody can guess what white does? <laughs> it reflects the light, right? So this is a is like a trick that you can use if you do not have a whole lot of light in your studio. It means that the surface that's in front of you can reflect the light back to you. So that allows you to have more light than you ever have. And also the opposite also stands true, right? Like if you didn't want to have too much light on your face, then if you choose a different color than white, then it will allow you to have less light on your face. So I really wanted to have a lot of light in my studio. So I, I, I was very intentional about the white. So as I'm positioning my light um, on top of my head here, right, as I'm positioning that, what that allows me to do is have that reflection, right, directly popping up right here on my face. And this is, um, you know, very, very important. So as you can see, it pops up, right? Um, and it pops up right in front of me. And what that does, as you can see, that's on, right on top is coming down, right? Uh, so that light is shining directly down to my head. So um, why? One thing you want to think about is that there's like hard shadows that you can have whenever you have this type of setup, lighting setup, you can have hard shadows um, under your eye, right? So how can you eliminate the harsh shadows that you can potentially have under your eye. Well, folks, the only way or one of the easiest way to eliminate that is by having a reflector, right? Um, and using your table as a reflector will allow you to eliminate those harsh shadows. Um, I know those things simply because I am a producer, I am a cinematographer, I'm a photographer as well. And so we use that with reflectors in our studio in order to remove the harsh shadows from our talent's neck under their eye, and especially when they wear glasses, right? Let me go back to my fellas that wear glasses. Um, it is important to know, um, you know, the different tweaks that you need to uh, do in your studio in order to eliminate those, um, you know, harsh shadows from your eyes. So if you take a look at my face right now, you will notice that I do not have harsh shadows on my face. And the way I was able to do this, and you can clearly see through my glasses, if you're watching the podcast right now, you can see I'm clear right here. You can clearly see my face. I don't have harsh shadows all over the place and the table was able to help me. So this was a trick that I just wanted to share with everyone, um, Alec, so they can use it. Um, and that can help them as well, you know, uh, for the folks that wear glasses or, you know, they have uh, issues with harsh shadows under their neck, their eye line and stuff like that. That is a way that I was able to combat that in my studio and the one about the glasses i know that's a, always a, a common question is where people have got the basically the lighting position just wrong so they're getting the uh, the reflection of the light directly in the glasses and uh, so yeah it's great to see the sort of positioning that you've got in your in your lighting setup there and uh, you you always look amazing on screen <laughs> it's uh, appreciate uh, it man to inspire <laughs> to. <laughs> well thanks jp i mean you've really just shared like a wealth of knowledge for everyone here i wonder if you could just maybe uh finish up with uh like what is the uh, the one bit of advice that you'd give for uh, somebody who's starting out and in, in live streaming and like you know what 
what is uh, uh what, what what is your kind of like tip maybe something that you wish you would uh, you would learn <laughs> right at the beginning or being told at the beginning your computer I'm going to say it again. If you're going to do live stream, and I wish I had known that when I started, the type of computer you have will allow you to do certain things or not allow you to do them. So the processor on your computer, right now I am using my M1 16 you know, gigabyte RAM uh, that I have right here on my decks, right? And this is, I saved my life, the M1 Mac mini 16 gigabyte RAM. If you're looking to purchase, right? Any computer dedicated to your live stream, I'm a highly, highly encourage you to get the M1. Why? Because it doesn't break the bank, but it does the job. I Again, remember, I help a whole lot of other companies doing their remote broadcasting, right? Sometimes we have multi-camera setup. Now, the eight gigabyte based on experience, right? Works just fine. If you're using one camera now, whenever you start having three, four guests, it starts doing, uh, 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 <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It <laughs> yep. starts freezing and, and you don't want that. So I will tell you future proof your investment and you know, you're going to need that in the future. Um, if you can afford it, get a good computer that has at least 16 gigabyte RAM with M1, right? Or if you use an Intel, I have Intel based um, Max here. Make sure you have at least 32 gigabyte RAM. This is based on my experience so that you can avoid a whole lot of headache. That's one thing that I wish I had known when I was starting out to eliminate a whole lot of issues that I was having um, and that saved my life. So. That will be my one advice for the folks that are starting now and really wanted to, you know, jump and, uh, you know, really save their lives on certain things. That's the headache you don't want to have. Trust me. Oh, that is such great advice. And uh, talking about like future proofing it, because I think we get into these things thinking about what we want to do now. Uh, and then when you start doing it, you realize, you know, all these other things that you can potentially do, like, you know, having guests on and <laughs> things like that. And that will tax mm -hmm. the computer even more. And live streaming is really one of the hardest things your computer will will be able to do. So Really sound advice there, JP. Absolutely. Yes, sir. Well, thank you so much. As I say, you've shared a wealth of knowledge. I'm sure it's going to be uh, super useful for everyone. And I've certainly learned a lot as well. And I just want to say again, a big thank you for being here. You've been an inspiration to me. And uh, I can't thank you enough for, for coming on. Listen, Alec, it's been an honor. Uh, I want to thank you again for inviting me here. And, you know, allow me to share some of my expertise with your community. And of course, if for anybody that um, I know we've gone to the end. I just looked up while you were talking. I'm like, oh, snap. Uh, we got to the <laughs> end of the flies. show. Time has gone back so fast, right? <laughs> but no, I, I just want to let you guys know um, I love that, uh, you know, we showed and we talked about earlier. My website is jphitech.com. jphitech.com. If you're listening to it, it's J P H I G H T E K. Dot com is my website. Connect with me. I'm more than happy to see how me and my team can, you know, help you grow. Or if you just want to follow me on social media, it's JP High Tech. Um, I am in all social media, uh, and especially I'm on YouTube as well. JP High Tech Reviews. Come join the uh, Content Creators University and let's grow together, um, you know, as content creators and business owners. So there you wow. go, Alec. Thanks again. I appreciate it. I highly recommend the Content Creators University. You'll learn a lot there as well. I've left links in the show notes to everywhere that you can find JP as well. Uh, and I'll also leave uh, links to the, uh, obviously the video replay of this and then also the uh, the pictures of JP Studio. So if you just want to have a little reference to uh, what we've been talking about, you'll find those all in the show notes as well. Thanks once again, JP. And uh, I look forward to speaking to you again soon. Likewise. In the next episode, we're going to be talking with Dr. Efrain Lopez, or Dr. Elo, as we know him. Uh, and he has got a really strong work ethic, in my opinion, uh, because of the way that he has a limited amount of time to spend on his content creation, juggling that with uh, full-time work and family life. Uh, and yet, he's very consistent about it. And it's not just a case of the actual content creation itself, 
but it's the uh, follow-up in terms of repurposing content and putting that out onto other platforms and creating micro content from it. It's something that if I'm totally honest, I've been a little bit lax at myself. Uh, it's always been on my list, but I've never quite got into the habit of doing it consistently. And it's something that I want to improve on. So I'm hoping that I'll be able to learn a few things from uh, Dr. Elo and looking forward to uh, sharing those uh, with you as well. So that is uh, the next episode with Dr. Elo. So until then, have a wonderful week.